the notion that 50 million Indian entrepreneurs should be starved of credit to grow their business is just a problem that stares you in the face. You know, many of us have been entrepreneurs. Much of what I have been able to accomplish uh, is linked to entrepreneurship. I started my first company in 1999. For you to decide that you wanted to start Indifi, what were some of the gaps that you saw in the market that led you to decide that, hey, this is what I want to spend the next decade or two in? There's no you know secret formula to entrepreneurial success, regardless of what background you come from or no background at all. You know, college students are building great companies these days. You know, people who want to start now, people who are looking to figure out where they play in the, the MSME lending or the fintech space. In terms of future opportunities, where do you see some interesting opportunities emerge? The most important risk in an MSME business is volatility of the business. Hello and welcome to the Indian Dream Podcast. I'm your host Siddharth and today we're going to be talking about an important problem that we need to solve as a country if we want to achieve the $10 trillion GDP dream. The problem is the MSME credit gap. Let me explain. MSME stands for micro, small and medium sized enterprises. The thing is, you won't hear about these businesses in the news. The media likes to focus on the big companies like Reliance, Tata, Adani's of the world. But the reality is, India has 64 million MSMEs and they contribute to 30% of the overall GDP. So it's obvious how important they are in India's GDP growth. But they suffer from a huge problem. There's a massive credit gap in this market. In simpler terms, these MSMEs need loan to run and grow their businesses, but there's nobody giving them these loans. According to a recent report by Vendes Capital, this gap stands at $530 billion. That's a lot of money that MSMEs need, but they're not getting it in form of loans. And it's not like we don't have the money to give to them. Sure, that's part of the problem. But the bigger problem is the large banks and NBFCs haven't really figured out an effective product and in some cases an effective business model to actually give out these loans. And that's exactly what our guest today, Mr. Alok Mittal, is solving with Indifi Technologies for the last eight years. I've been closely tracking Indifi for the last five years, and I'm a huge fan of how they've gone about building their business. They're a digital-first lending business that focuses on giving loans to restaurants, hotels, e-commerce businesses, retail stores, and many other MSMEs. And they use alternative data sources to decide if they want to give a loan to a particular MSME. Think Zomato and Swiggy data to decide if they want to give a loan to a restaurant, or Amazon and Flipkart data to decide if they want to give a loan to an e-commerce seller. You get the idea. They've raised close to $115 in debt and equity, and they give out loans worth 150 to 180 crores every single month. The reality is we need multiple more indices to plug the credit gap in the MSME market, but I'm glad somebody is showing us the blueprint on what it takes to actually give out loans to MSMEs. The interesting thing is, Alok was a venture capitalist before he started up, something that happens rarely because it's generally the other way around. And as a venture capitalist, he took multiple successful bets in companies like Cartrade, Happiest Mind Technologies, Equitas, and many more. And with all that experience of picking the right companies, he saw this huge gap in the market and decided to start Indifi Technologies back in 2015. And in the episode today, we're going to be talking about how he's gone about solving these problems, why banks and NBFCs have traditionally struggled and what the future really holds. Before we jump on to the conversation, I have the usual request of subscribing to the channel. There's a lot more coming your way over the next few months. And I really want you to tell me if you like these episodes and please comment to tell me what kind of industries or which founders would you like to have on the podcast. If you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple, please don't forget to give us a review. Without further ado, let's jump on to the conversation with Alok. Alok, so excited to have you on the Indian Dream podcast. Um, I've been a great admirer of your work since forever. We first met in 2019, but I know about Indifi since I think 2016-17. So finally getting a chance to talk to you. So excited to talk about Indifi and the journey that has been. Um, I want to start at back in 2015. Um, I know you were running a venture capital fund at that point in time. Um, for you to decide that you wanted to start Indifi, what were some of the gaps that you saw in the market that that led you to decide that, hey, this is what I want to spend the next decade or two in? Siddharth, first, thanks for having me on the podcast. Um, you know, it's a pleasure and I'm excited about this conversation. Um, the small business credit market, uh, you know, is a fairly evident market, right? In the sense that this gap has been there for a long time. Only about 15% of the Indian MSMEs get access to formal financing. Uh, I think what is less obvious uh, has been how to solve for it. Um, and we were uh, thinking about those elements, uh, you know, which led us to starting this business. And in 2014-15 timeframe, really the couple of strong uh, discontinuities that we saw had to do with A, the digitization of MSMEs, right? And hence the possibility of creating a digital platform 
rather than a branch based network which is the standard for operations in this business um and second be you know the data trails for small businesses were beginning to become available especially at that time through what we call as digital ecosystems whether it is e-commerce marketplaces payment platforms and the like and said so there was there was a thesis around being able to underwrite small businesses digitally uh, which has not been possible in the past so the combination of cost optimization access and solving for credit um, underwriting in a remote manner is really the opportunity that we saw emerging on the horizon when we started the company so we are talking about 60 million smes or msmes in in the country right and you're saying only 15% of them were traditionally sort of uh, given money to in terms of helping them grow the business tell me a little bit about what's the process of actually lending to msmes and why legacy institutions and banking institutions have still not been able to really crack it at scale yeah so you know the typical process um, starts with essentially first figuring out the product that you want to go with Uh, the most popular product here is a collateralized loan against property, uh, either residential or the business premises of the small business, um, and that becomes the first point of exclusion uh, because many of the small businesses either don't have a property that they own, or it is not at a level of formalization where banks would accept that as a collateral, or the customer just doesn't want to give uh, property as a collateral because they are looking for you know growth support for their business. They don't necessarily want to. uh risk their residence uh for being able to do that uh the second kind of popular product is what is called a business loan which is essentially an unsecured loan um you know typically 3 to 5 year uh, tenure um so i think the first uh, innovation here comes in the design of the product uh there are different use cases in msmes msmes is a very heterogeneous customer segment uh so for example if a business wants money for working capital then giving it a 7 year loan against property is the wrong product hmm. right and that leads to uh lack of acceptance on part of customers as well as uh, potentially bad credit quality right um why are, have banks and nbfcs not designed these faster turnaround shorter tenure and in many case smaller ticket size products because you know as you go from the top 10 million msmes to the next 10 million the size of the msme shrinks and the ticket size that they need shrinks you know that is because the profit pool in a loan is proportional to the size of the loan uh, and actually you know um uh, vary significantly by the tenure of the loan because that's the earning period uh, for the bank or the nbfc now how does this earning pool compare with the operating cost structure becomes a key determinant and that is why being able to digitize the process and bring down the operating cost structure is critical to being able to serve smaller and smaller msmes or even regular msmes for their smaller and smaller tenure uh, requirements right so this product challenge is kind of linked to the operating cost challenge um the second one as i mentioned is a credit risk challenge credit risk challenge uh, the typical way to scale an msme business is to have a branch based network and have underwriters in each of those locations right what that does is while it allows you to localize the underwriting it uh, prevents standardization of the underwriting process right so in many of the large msme lending businesses you will see the standard of underwriting change every 5 kilometers right and this risk scales up as your operational complexity goes up right so as you scale the business the operational risk and the credit risk actually goes up right and hence you don't see very many uh, unsecured sme lenders who operate at scale right Got and it. that is the context of digitization and then digital underwriting in terms of why they are important to scale up this business got it like when and we are lowering the operating costs allowing for the right, right product design and going down in the stack of size of the msme business right um, enabling the correct product design because we can now do smaller tenure smaller ticket size loans and then at the same time building a scalable underwriting engine where the quality of underwriting and quality of decisions improves with scale rather than deteriorates with scale got it i definitely want to double down on the scalable underwriting engine because that is crucial to how you've cracked this market but before we do that i want to talk about the importance of getting these msmes the right kind of capital to help them grow the business both from a country perspective individual perspective um and also the fact that traditionally i think not many people know about this but this market has been served by 
local money lenders where the interest rates could be insane so if you if you could help us understand uh, both those issues a little bit yeah absolutely you know uh, since there is uh, such a low penetration of formal credit to these uh, msmes uh, very often they have to go to local money lenders uh, in many communities the local money lenders are also the cheapest source of financing but in most cases uh, money lenders will charge you know 2 to 5% per month on a flat basis right that is a very high cost of capital and second obviously because the business there is not regulated there is very little customer protection uh, in those businesses right and hence being able to formalize this uh, business bring lower cost of capital to uh, msmes uh, but more importantly expand the availability of such access um, our key priorities you know msmes account for about a third to 40% of india's gdp as well as exports right and so there is a strong national imperative and that is reflected in the policy push uh, towards enabling msmes along various dimensions market linkages uh, tax incentives but also uh, credit access so you will see the government and the regulator periodically come up with uh, schemes that will allow deeper penetration of credit to msmes i think at a personal level uh, you know many of us have been entrepreneurs uh, much of what i have been able to accomplish uh, is linked to entrepreneurship i started my first company in 1999 and hence the notion that 50 million indian entrepreneurs should be starved of credit to grow their business is just a problem that stares you in the face right that doesn't sit well with us so there is a uh, you know macro argument to be made of why this problem is important and hence what is the opportunity size and you can build a large business doing this but there is also a micro uh, argument uh, to be made where you know entrepreneurs should have uh, ready access to financing uh, to grow their businesses i think that is just uh, if you call it the right to grow of entrepreneurs uh, fascinating in in how you thought about this whole problem in terms of micro and micro um now i want to talk about the scalable underwriting engine I think one of the key things that I read about Indifi is the alternative use of alternative data sources, right? Um, so if you could help us understand what these alternative data sources are, what kind of MSMEs you lend, the focus on verticalization in terms of how you do underwriting, I think these are some some interesting points that that sort of stood out for me when I was reading about it. Yeah, uh, and said a lot of time when we talk about the scalable underwriting engines, we get lost in the buzzword of artificial intelligence and so on, right? Right. And sure, we do all of that. but i think uh, in this business given that we are not dealing with performance data of tens of million msmes but hundreds of thousands of msmes um, the design is equally important what do you want the ai engine to answer right and broadly in the credit business there are two core risks that have been uh, you know attempted uh, to be answered one is the um, willingness of the customer to pay which is largely indexed on the bureau profile but on ground msme lenders will also go out have a conversation with the entrepreneur to figure out whether there is intent on part of the customer to pay second is the ability of the customer to pay which is typically done by income assessment um and i must say that on those two counts um uh, by and large the industry uh, operates in a lockstep right as we went into digital lending for msmes we saw two more risks that had to be answered one at a ecosystem level in our mind the most important risk in an msme business is volatility of the business right so when you are judging the intent and you are judging especially the ability of the business to pay back you are judging it at the point of acquiring the customer what will happen to the customer over the next 3 years is largely an unknown and the industry has relatively broad brush strokes at determining that of saying if the company has been running for 3 years then it's likely it will continue to run for the next 3 years however what we noticed was that different industries had different survival factors so if you take restaurants for example about 15% of restaurants shut down every year it's a much higher mortality rate than for example grocery stores right and what drives mortality in a restaurant business is different from what drives mortality in a grocery business so what we have done is created these vertical stability or volatility indicators so to say which act as overlays to our core credit model and answer the question about how volatile is the business likely to be and that can determine whether we can provide credit to that business or not but it can also determine for what duration we go in and take an exposure to that business before we reassess it right 
So that has been one critical part and that varies by segment. But today, again, in segments where we've been present for three to four years, uh, these are all data driven uh, volatility models. The fourth one that um, actually in some sense is our creation and hence we have to solve for it is in the digital lending. You know, the risk of frauds, asserting the presence of the customer, uh, you know, those questions uh, have to be answered afresh. And hence, there is another set of alternate data driven models we have created, uh, which answer these questions of is the customer who they claim they are, are they present where they claim they are? Um, and that is, uh, you know, driven through their uh, communication footprint, so to say. Um, so those are the alternate data points that we use to answer that question. So really, Going from the intent and ability, we have kind of expanded the realm of credit questions uh, to volatility and presence. Um, and it is in these last two pieces that we use most of the alternate data. So Alok, I'd love to understand the kind of sectors that you play in and like one example of the kind of alternative data sources that you would use to evaluate, you know, uh, businesses in that particular sector. Sure, sure. So um, we are largely oriented towards retailers and the distribution chain. Um, we would cover retailers in grocery, pharmaceuticals, uh, food services, electronics, uh, and apparels. And then the wholesalers and distributors who serve those retailers. Right? So those are the segments where we are present. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the volatility risk of a customer varies across uh, these segments. Um, coming back to the restaurant segment, for example, um, one of the indicators of uh, the stability or the health of the business uh, lies in uh, what kind of products is the restaurant into, right? What cuisine, what uh, price, uh, and that varies by micro market. Uh, but also, you know, what are customers saying about that business? Are customers loving the food? Are customers saying this food used to be great, but it's not great anymore? Uh, are they saying that the service isn't great? Um, is their share of business volatile from these customers? They get a lot of business during high periods, but are not able to sustain that. So those are some of the alternate data points that we use uh, to determine the stability of the restaurant there. Now, if you contrast it with, let's say, an e-commerce business, uh, right? Uh, there is not a lot of service quality that sellers control. Those are controlled by marketplaces. And to that extent, the competitiveness on those marketplaces starts to become critical. Is this business going to get discounted out of the marketplace uh, in the near future, right? Uh, so what's uh, SKUs is the business dealing with? What is the degree of competition and discounting in those SKUs? Uh, you know, could, those are the questions that start to determine whether there is uh, ongoing potential in the business or not. Uh, so that's kind of one example of how uh, alternate data that we use in different segment varies to essentially answer the same question of can we see this business thriving after two years or three years? So would you then get a lot of data from marketplaces like Amazon, Flipkart or Zomato, Swiggy and, and sort of study the kind of uh, profiles that these people have there? When we partner with uh, marketplaces, uh, they do give us some amount of data, uh, but that has largely to do with the transaction uh, history uh, and the you know high level quality metrics of that business. Uh, we have then established our own data sources independent of such uh, marketplaces. Uh, where we derive more detailed information around what the customers uh, are doing on those marketplaces um, and hence be able to answer these questions more granularly, but also regardless of which channel does the customer come to us from. Interesting. You know, interestingly, what I just realized is you probably now have a lot of context and data about what it takes to succeed in a particular industry. So you could technically build a playbook for a lot of these entrepreneurs saying that, Hey, if you want to get, build a successful restaurant, here are the things that you need to take care of or a successful e-commerce business and so on and so forth. Yeah. I think in terms of the output metrics, we would have a fair bit of that. Uh, we are not necessarily operators of a restaurant or an e-commerce business. So how to get to those output metrics is not necessarily our expertise. I'm sure our customers know more about that than we do. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, the other thing that I, that I noticed was the focus on women entrepreneurs. Um, I'd love to understand a little bit about the kind of challenges women entrepreneurs face in the country and why is it important to, to fund them? Yeah. So I think, uh, uh, see credit is a risk discrimination business. What that means is that uh, lenders will go wherever they see lower risk. Lenders will um, refrain from going where they see higher risk, right? And many times what is causing that lower or higher risk is not our preserve, right? 
Now, um, what has happened over time, just given the culture and the history of um, you know different regions in the country, this is not uniform across India, uh, is that many times, for example, you know, women co-owners have been brought into the business for reasons other than them really running a business. Right? There is a person who doesn't want to run two businesses on his name. One is on the wife's name. One is on the husband's name. Right? Uh, and so there is this dichotomy which we see more in um, you know businesses that carry the women's name and that is why you know when lenders are lending to them they can't allocate a lot of meaning to saying is this woman really running the business or she's is she not or is there actually adverse signal sitting where a woman's name is put on the board but she's not running the business right we all know that when women are running their businesses the credit quality is extremely good right so microfinance businesses have demonstrated that right so I think that is really the zone where we know that women borrowers, you know, on the margin are better borrowers than uh, men, right? But we don't quite know whether the woman is really running the business or not, or is she just there on the nameplate, right? So uh, that starts to form then um, opinions, uh, which, you know, we will call intelligence without data. Um, uh, and that starts to inform decisions which lead to further exclusion of these segments. Right. So if there's an underwriter who has formed a view that when they see a woman's name on the nameplate, chances are they're not running the business and hence uh, this business may carry higher risk, you know, then even the inquiry into whether the woman is really running the business or not starts to take a sidestep. Right. Now, I think in that sense, data driven models are actually superior because you're building insights based on actual data and not basis these opinions that get passed down from one generation to another. So in some sense, the adverse exclusion, uh, you know, exclusionary view that we have formed, right, uh, starts to go away. That bias starts to creep out, right? And hence, I think on digital platforms, you will see in general uh, that uh, underrepresented sections tend to get more credit, right? So just if you talk numbers, um, you know, somewhere in the high teens is the number of small businesses operated by women. Uh, the broader bank and NBFC credit share is about 10%. On our platform and on other digital platforms, uh, you know, women score about 20% in terms of share of business, right? So that is beginning to correct because we haven't built that bias into the data model, right? Women always deserve that credit that they're getting now, right? But yeah, it is the, the onus is on us now to ascertain whether it's the name on the nameplate or is the woman actually running the business. And we do those checks. We talk to the entrepreneurs uh, to make sure we understand who's really running the business. And if it is a man running the business, that's fine as long as then they are the primary borrower and we are evaluating the risk as per their credit history. The woman running a business, uh, you know, that's great. And we will then evaluate the loan proposal accordingly. Interesting. So I don't think we are doing something specific to boost that hmm. as much as taking the bias that has existed for years yeah. out of the equation. Interesting. I think for banks and NBFCs or at least large banks and NBFCs, um, the availability of, the, you know, the opportunities is so high that it's easy for them to say, hey, we don't really get it. And therefore, let's just avoid it completely. So there's generalization in terms of avoiding industries and, you know, certain segments just because there are so many other opportunities where you could potentially deploy capital. Yes, I, I'm not sure I agree with that. You know, uh, banks want to do this. Hmm. Right. Uh, between the intent and execution, there is five layers of employees. Right. There is this disparity in underwriting every five kilometers that happens. Right. Not because it. all of this is people driven and it's not necessarily, uh, you know, data driven. Interesting. So despite best intent and hunger and capital, these problems are not getting solved. And that is why it, it requires a, you know, change in the process model. Interesting. Now, the outcome of this is 50% uh, of the business that we do as Indifi is actually done by other banks and NBFCs. Hmm. Right? So it's not that they are, you know, not pro-innovation. They are not pro-inclusion. They are all of that. But they need a way to be able to do this at a reasonable operating cost. They need to be able to control credit risk while going down the spectrum in MSME lending. Right? They need to be able to uh, calibrate the risk of a loan, whether it is a female borrower or a male borrower. Right. And as soon as they see that solution, there is a deluge, right? Because they are, they're hungry for growth. They want to chase these objectives. Absolutely. Interesting. 
that part about working with banks and nbfcs i want to double down on that i think there have been multiple startups who've taken an alternative approach where they've realized that hey partnering with banks and nbfcs results in delays in terms of taking the credit call or you know actually deploying the money and therefore impacting the customer experience and they went down the route of actually forming their own nbfc and primarily doing lending through that versus an indie fee which does both i think um, you have your own sort of uh, nbfc that lends and also partnering with uh, banks and nbfcs what was the decision criteria to and and how did you make that happen so that the customer experience doesn't get impacted yeah yeah so i think first it depends on the product category you're in right if you are in a product category that requires a 5 second or you know even 5 minutes to disbursal hmm right then you want fully integrated stacks right and having your own nbfc starts to give you more degrees of control on that our view is that in most part msme lending is not sensitive to 5 seconds or 5 minutes right it is sensitive in the matter of a day or two days right but it's not the kind of msme lending we are doing uh, the borrower uh, treats you know one day as a great experience okay so i think i think there is that distinction that needs to get drawn now having said that uh the maturity of uh, banks and nbfcs on the technology stack has continuously improved right so what we used to see 5 years back where files could go some cases even physically to the bank for underwriting today none of that is there right most banks that were integrated with today are integrated through an api uh they offer near real, real time decisioning right and hence that gap has been narrowing the reason we decided to have our nbfc in this whole context is because we are not just trying to act as a distributor for the existing product of the bank but we are trying to innovate on the product both in terms of product characteristics tenure right things like those but also the credit risk uh, part of the product right and uh, what we do is when we introduce these new credit models new processes uh, novel use of technology uh, we experiment with all of that on our, on our own nbfc we want to make sure that we know it works before we take it out to the market and so that is really the purpose that our nbfc serves uh, but the cost of capital of my, my nbfc is nowhere close to a cost of capital of a large bank and so it is in the borrower's interest um, and it is in my interest and the bank's interest for us to be able to partner to be able to deliver more efficient credit to the borrower uh, than to try and insert our nbfc everywhere so really the way we look at it is that uh, our nbfc should act as a innovation sandbox uh right along multiple dimensions and then whatever is proven and we are able to uh establish the appetite of the bank or the larger nbfc for that product process uh that should then start to go to those banks and nbfcs they feel very comfortable with this because they know that they are not the guinea pig makes complete sense makes complete so, so it helps us build that trust with them interesting now talking about the the innovation that has happened in the digital stack the technology infrastructure over the last few years i think it's been phenomenal um in terms of i think back in 2015 we were just starting to talk about ekyc and enatch um around that time or probably 2017 18 to now where there are so many interesting innovations that are happening so i want to double down on that um tell me a little bit about the kind of digital innovations that have happened that have really helped you in terms of growing this business and and the potential ahead now no absolutely i think uh, many of the fintech businesses and certainly a business like ours has been a huge beneficiary of the investments in the digital public infrastructure right uh, and when we started the company in 2014 really what was visible at that time you know was the jam trinity hmm. right jandan aadhar and mobile was all that there was uh, to the dpi uh, infrastructure um once aadhar took its roots you know other products like ekyc uh, esign uh, electronic nash you know those started to become available on those uh, today for example more than 90% of all loans on our platform would be electronically signed and uh, be repaid through a uh, enash uh, mandate right uh, so over the last 5 6 years you know that has gone from literally zero to 90% plus uh, for a business like ours I think the second big one um, is the UPI, um, and the digitization of payments has multiplied the amount of data that is available for underwriting in a in a reliable format. Right. So I talked earlier about ecosystem data, transaction footprints, and so on. Um, when we started the company, we started with e-commerce marketplaces, and that probably had a couple of million merchants 
in all uh, that were addressable through that approach. Right. Um, and payment existed to the extent that credit card swipe machines existed. Right. So again, fairly small numbers there. Today, more than 20 million merchants, you know, have a significant footprint on payment ecosystems. And hence the addressable market uh, for digital lending, digital underwriting uh, has increased substantially. Um, and that is also a driver for what will take these 10 million included customers to 20 or 30 million included customers. Right. Uh, so I think that has been a big enabler. Uh, amongst things that we see now and into the future, account aggregator is a bet here and now. Uh, for about 70% of our loans, we still collect bank statements. Uh, that is a high friction product, uh, process today. Um, we are uh, now live on account aggregator, even though there are gaps in that offering right now. Directionally, I think we are headed uh, in the right direction. Uh, and that should lower the friction uh, in having access to financial data of the customer with their consent and thereby being able to make faster and better credit decisions. Right? Amongst things that uh, you know are uh, on the horizon, um, I think platforms like Oken, uh, new ecosystems like ONDC, uh, new infrastructure like public credit registry, um, I think all of those are um, projects in works uh, and can have a substantial impact. So, yeah, apart from what we have done as companies, uh, you know, there is this huge tailwind in terms of the digital public infrastructure and in MSME sector in terms of policy support for MSME growth and lending. Uh, which have enabled us to grow. Regardless of all the innovations that fintech companies have done over the last decade or so, without the digital public infrastructure, a lot of the market would have been fairly capped, right? Because whatever you do, if the cost of lending is fairly high, there's only so many people that you can actually reach out to in, in order to give them credit at a cost that matters. Would you agree with that? Or do you think that has just helped, um, cause, that has just helped in terms of getting there faster? And the companies would have still innovated and figured it out. Um, and the reason why I ask this is because there are so many different institutions that you have to deal with a bank, uh, you know, transaction data here and here and there, the eco the ecosystem that you actually have to deal with. If that's not digitally connected, it becomes significantly higher. I would assume. No. So I think the role of digital public infrastructure certainly has been transformative, right? It's not incremental. Yeah. Um, so to that extent, uh, you know, I do think it's hard to today imagine uh, the path not taken. Um, I do have, you know, very strong conviction in power of entrepreneurship. Uh, I think entrepreneurs would have solved for some of these issues uh, independently, but far more inefficiently. It might have taken a lot more capital and a lot more time uh, to get to where we are. Uh, also, I think uh, the relative standardization across the industry would have been missing. And so these innovations might have existed in pockets rather than get to country level scale. So today when we go to a bank or an NBFC and we say e-sign, everyone understands what that means. Everyone understands that that has, uh, you know, uh, legal uh, uh, sanctity, right? So we are not debating the process of doing an e-sign or trying to customize the process of doing e-sign with every bank or every NBFC. So I think standardization of these uh, technologies has its own benefits in terms of rapid scale. Uh, so certainly I think of these infrastructure elements as... Uh, uh, you know, core enablers and not just as incremental utilities. I want to double click on Oken, um, open credit enablement network. How do you think it fundamentally, do you think it has the potential to fundamentally sort of disrupt a lot of this uh, lending that's happening in terms of um, the fact that multiple banks could compete to actually give a loan to a particular person? Do you think it has that element of disruption or do you think it's the element of more efficient in terms of how you're going about things? I think of it as more efficiency. Um, you know, the common set of APIs can take that burden away, uh, again, from each fintech and each bank to agree on what those APIs should look like. Right? Uh, it can lead to standardization faster, right? Uh, cheaper, all of that. Um, I think the second prospect that you mentioned of banks competing with each other and so on, um, I think that is an interesting possibility. Uh, what is constraining that possibility in my mind is a uh, lack of market making, right? So for example, if you compare that with ONDC, right, very large digital players today are uh, adopting ONDC and hence creating that marketplace where a seller buyer community can exist, right? 
uh, in Oaken, unfortunately, we have not seen large players uh, take that approach, right? And part of the reason might be that, uh, you know, lenders are in the business of lending, right? So they, they are used to taking this complexity and to the extent possible, they want to retain a degree of proprietoriness in that process. So if the underlying process is not streamlined or standardized, then for the marketplaces to get standardized is hard, right? If you don't agree on uh, what should be the KYC process, hmm. right? If you don't agree on what should be the underwriting engine or what should be the data variables that go into the underwriting engine, then it's very hard for those APIs to really be competitive in nature. The APIs become the lowest common denominator, right? Um, so I think that is one difference between let's say uh, e-commerce sale where there is relative agreement on what a customer journey looks like. You know, most e-commerce sites are three page sites. Uh, and hence the degree of standardization at a process layer is far higher than uh, what exists in, uh, especially things like MSME lending. Now, if you start taking, uh, you know, real time credit bureau based personal loans, uh, that is probably a product where there is enough standardization to enable such a marketplace if again, large pockets of demand or supply were to come to the table. Got it. Makes sense. Um, in terms of future opportunities, where do you think, you know, people who want to start now, people who are looking to to figure out where they play in the, in the MSME lending or the fintech space, where do you see some interesting opportunities emerge? Because you're on the ground, you have a unique vantage point to this. Yeah. So I think there is an opportunity in building horizontally. And what I mean by that is, you know, there are very successful companies that are doing the API layers, abstraction layers, right? There are companies that are doing uh, infrastructure, right? And there are companies like ours who are playing the full stack. There are companies that are playing just distribution, right? So that is one dimension along which entrepreneurs could think about how they want to play in the digital credit space. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity vertically, right? As I mentioned earlier, small businesses are very heterogeneous. Uh, so you could you know, literally pick a uh, industry slice and say, we are going to be the best at this, right? So if you look at someone like Samunati, you know, they are great at agri, uh, you know, if you look at Refin, they are beginning to make a mark in EV financing, um, right? So each of these spaces uh, offers a potential to, you know, dive deep uh, and create a superior product and a credit uh, offering. Um, I think uh, apart from these, there is the general direction of, you know, ecosystem based lending that we uh, deeply buy into. The way we are enabling it is partnering with ecosystems that are out there. Uh, there are companies that are also building those ecosystems and then layering credit on top of that. Right. So these are MSME SaaS companies which have built customer engagement and uh, penetration. And they're saying now we can use that data and access to drive more credit. So you will see more of these bundled models. Uh, so the business model innovation really is unbundling what existed earlier. So unbundling an NBFC or a bank structure to say, hey guys, as a fintech, I can add value on the front end of your business, right? You continue to own capital, credit, right, uh, collections. Um, and then there is rebundling of saying, hey, by the way, the customer wants to be able to access credit through their transaction interface and not necessarily by walking into a bank branch so why don't we rebundle the distribution side of credit business uh, with an ERP system, right? So I think that is where the business model innovations are coming from. Uh, and I do think that more of those will, will show up. Yeah, I read this interesting tweet about most interesting business opportunities, uh, either are bundling things or unbundling things. And it's counterintuitive that both, both sort of happen at the same time. But interesting opportunities come from just doing either of those two things. No, absolutely. I think a lot of payment businesses are doing credit. Uh, right. That's an interesting opportunity. So banks have had payment and banks have had credit all the time. But if you look at a merchant acquiring business of a bank and a small business lending business of a bank, they simply set, they basically set a silos. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So they have, the banks haven't bundled those two, but they're not, you know, new age payment companies that are coming in with that as the driving hypothesis. The work that you've been doing is extremely inspiring. Um, and, and one of the things that I noticed is actually, I wanted to ask this question. How much did, you know, being a VC right before this, um, for a good eight, 10 years, uh, before you started Indifi and, and looking at some, somebody like an Equitas, 
influence that decision that hey this opportunity could be huge um yeah i'd love to understand that yeah i don't think in terms of appreciating the size of the opportunity it was a core driver uh, you know many of my fellow entrepreneurs spotted this opportunity coming from completely different backgrounds right um you know we respect companies like i finance lending card deeply uh and they have built larger businesses uh in a shorter time frame um so i don't think that was the determinant i think some of the approach we took towards ecosystem based lending and what has allowed us to become successful there uh was driven by that venture view of saying there are the all of these consumer technology platforms that are coming up but guess what it's, you know on the supply side it's small businesses sitting there right so can we go back to the same platforms and allow them to uh strengthen their supply side of the business by offering credit through them right so i think that early insight might have uh, you know uh, arisen out of my uh, venture career uh, but yeah there is no there is no you know secret formula to entrepreneurial success it's just you know a being on the road uh, fighting as hard as you can and being persistent at doing that uh, and regardless of what background you come from or no background at all you know college students are building great companies these days uh i think that that is what it takes to uh, be successful entrepreneurially yeah i think uh, you're a big proponent of actually being on the ground and meeting the customers um and that's something that you genuinely believe in in terms of what decides if a early stage entrepreneur is going to be successful or not tell me a little bit more about how how and why that's important yeah you know at a, at a early stage uh, problem statements are known to everyone as i mentioned the problem of msme credit is known for decades now right i think what brings value at a early stage is having context and insights into that problem statement why does it exist right uh, and for example in the same space you could take a view that small businesses are underserved because uh, you know banks don't have the technology uh, you know they can win business much more easily in another part of the ecosystem why go there uh, right but we operated with an assumption that banks are smart they are hungry and they have the capital and in spite of that if this is not happening that means there is some underlying constraint some underlying innovation that needs to come in and to solve this right and it is that uh, perspective uh, you know that allowed us to then say okay what is the insight what do we need to solve for otherwise we could have been lazy in saying banks are stupid and uh, don't want to solve for this problem right uh, and hence we went to saying okay there is an underwriting problem there is an operating cost problem uh, so at least you know in in my mind that process is extremely important right today you know the problem of healthcare reaching every nook and corner of the country is well known right but why does that problem exist right what is what is the entrepreneur's unique insight in saying hey here's my hypothesis of why that exists assuming that everyone else in the world is equally motivated to solve this problem they are equally smart and they can get the capital that i can get Right. got it so i think that that's the reason why uh, i think uh, you know customer empathy and connect is is integral to uh, building a startup yeah and it's not necessary that your first hypothesis might be correct the, but the fact that you were on the ground taking a bet figuring out if it works or not and then sort of iterating on it is what eventually gets you to the answer that's scalable hopefully as i yeah. said there's no formula for success yeah uh, but this is the best playbook we know of yeah Perfect. Thank you so much, Alok. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Uh, wish you all the best with what you're doing with Indifi. Um, and thank you so much for inspiring uh, a generation. I think uh, just supporting MSME entrepreneurs is is a noble cause, regardless of the fact that it you know it's a profitable opportunity and all of that. Um, the country needs it. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you, Sid. I enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for having me here.